Hey, well, good morning. If you are a, um, if you're a guest with us and uh, you have a child under sixth grade, we have a nursery and we also have a children's program that they're welcome to go to. If you want them to stay in here with you, that's fine too. Uh, but just wanted to let you know out the back doors, uh, straight out the back there, we have a great uh, children's class and nursery. Everybody take your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah 9, if you have your Bible with you. If you don't, you can look on the screen this morning, uh, but Isaiah chapter number 9, Isaiah uh, 9 is what we've been looking at for really the last uh, three weeks. We'll look at it again this week and then uh, next week, and I am so excited about it. Uh, I'm going to read the verse there, Isaiah 9, 6, and we'll do a little bit of recap, and uh, we'll jump into today's text. The Bible says this in Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, what's that first name there? Wonderful. And then, Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so we've talked about uh, Christ, the Wonderful One, the Counselor. Uh, last week we talked about the mighty God. By the way, uh, last week we asked, I asked the question, uh, who your favorite superhero was? I asked, uh, whose favorite superhero was Superman? And we had a small representation, but there's a lot of guests with us today. How many of you, your favorite superhero is Superman? Raise your hand. I'm trying to figure out exactly who I like out of this room right now. I just want you to know that I'm repping today. <laughs> Super, check those babies out right there. Superman, and my favorite superhero. But we said this. Did you see those? Man. Uh, Superman doesn't have anything. You've never seen a preacher do that in church, have you? Ever. It won't ever happen again either because my wife's going to get on to me in a minute. Uh, Superman doesn't have anything on Jesus. And we talked about the might of our God and uh, Jesus Christ and uh, the power he had over creation and eternity and all that there is. And man, uh, what a tremendous, tremendous thought. But today we're going to look at Christ, the everlasting father. Now let's think for a moment. And as you think about that, uh, you're thinking to yourself, well, wasn't uh, Jesus Christ the son of God, right? Son of God. We believe in the Trinity, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. So why then would Jesus Christ be foretold as the everlasting father. It sounds uh, like something that we'd hear about in Kentucky, right? Like I'm my own grandpa. That was supposed to get more laughs. I planned that out. I got no other jokes today. That was all I had and it flopped. Oh my goodness. Uh, no, Jesus Christ, the everlasting father. What does that mean? And uh, this morning, we're going to look at this verse. We're going to take a, a look into some doctrine as we begin. And uh, so I'd encourage you, as we're looking at that, if you think to yourself, man, this is a little over my head, a little heavier than what I'm used to, let me encourage you, hey, listen intently, uh, tune in, and then we'll get to practically how uh, this feeds into and plays into our life. Isaiah, just to give you a little bit of backdrop here, Isaiah was a prophet in Judea, and he was some seven centuries before the birth of Christ. If you read uh, the book of Isaiah, you'll find that uh, God revealed to Isaiah not only these names, but other things about the promised Messiah. Matter of fact, one of my favorite prophecies in the book of Isaiah is found in Isaiah chapter number 53. And if you have your Bible, why don't you turn over there as we begin Isaiah uh, chapter number 53. <coughs> and this is a it's a well-known passage, keep in mind, seven centuries before Christ, but it foretells the death of Christ on the cross, the death by which he paid the penalty uh, for sin. And let me pause for just a moment and say this prophecy and its fulfillment uh, later on in the New Testament, uh, these are some of the reasons that I cling to for my faith. You say, well, it could be a fairy tale. Anybody can write a good novel. Anybody can write a good story. You understand that the Bible was recorded by different men over many different areas, different continents even. Forty plus men recorded scripture over thousands of years worth of span. And yet, we don't find contradiction within the Bible. Matter of fact, we find prophecy that is exactly fulfilled uh, by Jesus Christ. And so, a lot of people would say, well, faith is just kind of a, an ignorant thing. Faith is, is really just, uh, it's a crutch for you. We talked about this yesterday at the funeral. Uh, faith is for the feeble-minded. Can I just tell you this? Uh, my faith is rooted in, grounded on the Word of God 
And to me, the word of God is one of the most beautiful gifts God's ever given us. The word of God allows us to study and and know God and know him more. And uh, let me just say this. Whenever I find somebody that intrigues me, I want to learn about them. Are you with me? So when I was a kid, for example, when I was a kid, uh, I loved Pistol Pete Maravich. Anybody Pistol Pete Maravich? I mean, I loved Pistol Pete. So I'm like, listen, I'm going to find out all I can about Pistol Pete. Right. And so I, I watched the Pistol Pete movie. And man, if you're if you're if you've never seen that fine piece of classic cinema, you are missing out. Uh, I tried to practice the dribbling, uh, the dribbling moves, the spider and all the different stuff. He, he slept with a basketball. And so I slept with a basketball. Right. Uh, he, he would put things on his feet to help him grow. I did it too, right? Uh, why? Because he intrigued me. I liked what he did, and so I wanted to know about him. Are you following what I'm saying? Abraham Lincoln, same thing. I wanted to know who he was because I liked what he did. When I got a little bit older, uh, Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were in that home run. Jet. Anybody remember Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa? That was one of the best years of baseball there's ever been, and then Barry Bonds came and messed it up. Uh, Mark McGuire... And I lived in Paducah, Kentucky, and the closest baseball team, St. Louis Cardinals, that was my team. And so here comes Mark McGuire, and man, Mark McGuire just took off, and I'm like, I want to know about this guy. So I bought a book, and I read it, Kurt Warner. You remember Kurt Warner came to the football league, and he's stocking grocery store shelves, and next thing you know, he's an MVP and a Super Bowl winning quarterback. So I bought a biography because I wanted to know about Kurt Warner. What can I tell you? That no one's ever impacted my life like God. And because of that... I want to know him. You know, a lot of times I'll I'll hear from people uh, that maybe they're being introduced to Christianity or they've just placed their faith in Christ or stuff like that. And they'll say, you know, I I would read the Bible, but it's, it's hard to read. Can I just encourage you with this thought? It's worth spending the time and effort to get to know God. Man, it's worth spending the time and the effort uh, to get to know God. And can I tell you that although I will give you the gospel and I'll do my uh, best to preach to you and and to preach to you the correct truth, I I want you to go home and vet it. I want you to go home and study it for yourself. Listen, I don't want to just spoon feed you on Sunday morning. Hey, go home and grill some meat yourself, right? That's good. And uh, Isaiah chapter number 53, one of my favorite prophecies in the Bible. If, you're, if you have your Bibles there, you can look. If you don't, you can look on the screen there. Verse number five, uh, verse number five there. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. You know, I've heard some people look at prophecy in the Old Testament and say, well, I mean, let's be honest, they knew this. They could have manipulated it. They could have twisted truth. You understand that much of the prophecy in the Bible, was out of the control of Jesus or his parents. What are you saying? I'm saying Jesus didn't ask anybody to beat him. Jesus didn't ask anybody to give him stripes. You following what I'm saying? Jesus, I, I, what, I, what are you saying? I'm saying Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. He was the long-awaited one. When we talk about, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ was the fulfillment. He was God with mankind. That song that we sang there, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, the second verse said day spring. That idea, day spring, uh, is found in Luke chapter number one. And that word day spring talks about dawn, Jesus, the dawn of uh, of life. He brought light to the world. Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of prophecy. That's an incredible, incredible thing. Did you catch what I said in those verses though? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for whose iniquities? Our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we're healed. That's what Christian faith, that's what we would call, it's a, it's a word that we don't use much, but it's what we would call a substitutionary atonement. 
It, it means somebody else took our place. He, he was our substitute. He died in our place. His death paid the price for our sin. Let's take that step further. All our evil thoughts, right? All, all of our words and actions, the way we act when we drive in Florida, yeah? Simply put, God punished Jesus instead of us. Instead of us. And therefore, we have forgiveness of sins through, through Jesus Christ, through faith in Christ. And that's the promise and the hope of the gospel, both for us who look back to Christ and those in the ancient times who look forward to Christ, their Messiah. So if we look at Isaiah 9, 6 and we, we break it down, the prophet makes it very clear that the Messiah is not going to be any ordinary man. He's not a mere political or military leader. He wasn't going to be the king of an earthly dominion or a general to lead his people in conquest over the nations of the world. And he would be far more than just a common teacher uh, or prophet. There have been dozens of those in Israel's history. No, the Messiah would be absolutely unique. Nothing like it seen in in the history of the world and uh, nothing will ever be seen like Jesus Christ. He be God in the flesh. God became man. God in all of his power and might and wisdom and glory, yet somehow fully man. And the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament tells us in Matthew chapter number 1, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That's what Jesus would, God with us. Think about that. Not Listen to me, not God out there somewhere. Not God beyond the boundaries of the universe. Not God in the twilight zone, right? But God here in our midst. God walking among us as a flesh and blood person. And that's what the title there, Everlasting Father, uh, signifies. So let's look at that verse again. Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. Can you turn your attention back there? This time as we read it, can we read it all together this morning? All together, Isaiah uh, chapter number 9, verse number 6. The Bible says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So let's think about this. And there are a lot of different ways that one uh, can take this in uh, different directions that uh, you can steer here. But I believe that as he refers to the Messiah here, the one that would come as the everlasting father, he, w- he was setting the plate here for, for Israel to understand that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would be God. I understand this, that the people who first received this prophecy, the Jews, they had no concept at this time of the Trinity, uh, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, they had no concept of that. They didn't conceive of God as both one and three at the same time. Uh, one, one essence, three co-equal persons, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They knew God as Father. So as we look here, as, ident- as, as Isaiah identified the Messiah to come as the everlasting Father, He was communicating to them, and really the only way that they could understand that the Messiah, listen to me, would be God in the flesh. Now, I can see some of you right now, your brains are like, they're they're just just getting into uh, just mud, and they're getting a little muddy here. Can I encourage you, stick with me for a moment here. Uh, The Bible teaches us that Jesus uh, was 100% God, yet 100% man. And so Isaiah here, setting uh, early, uh, setting them up for God to be their Savior, for Jesus Christ to be their Deliverer, Jesus uh, to be their King. So as Jesus was born and he grew to manhood and he began to teach, he acknowledged that he, in fact, was God. I, I've heard people say, well, I mean, Jesus, uh, okay, we'll give you... He- of God, or he was a good teacher, or he was a, he was a prophet, uh, and, and I've sat down with people in other religions that would, would teach, yes, Jesus was an influential person, and all, all of these types of things. Can I say that Jesus claimed to be God? John chapter number 10, verse number 30, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, he says, I and my Father are one. 
I and my father are one. You may, you may remember that that particular statement almost got him stoned for blasphemy. And then another time as Jesus is speaking to his disciples in John chapter number 14, a chapter, uh, verse number 6 through 10, Kevin actually uh, read the chapter right around this yesterday at the service, but Jesus said in verse number 6, Jesus say, uh, saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. From henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. If, if, if they had seen Jesus, they'd seen the Father, because Jesus fully revealed God, and the only one that can fully reveal God is God. But then taking it a step further in the book of Hebrews, the writer says in verse number 3 of chapter number 1, who, speaking of Jesus, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ uh, had purged our sins. And then I love verse number eight, and here's why. We'll read it together, and then I'll tell you exactly why I love it. The Bible says, this is God the Father, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne, the next two words are what? O God, who's speaking? Father speaking to who? The Son, and what does he call him? God, God himself calls Jesus the Son. God, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. By the way, we're going to look at that in a moment. The everlasting Father, no beginning, no end. Jesus, the everlasting one. The Bible says a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. What are you saying? There's nothing that is true about God that's also not true about Jesus. God is Jesus, Jesus, God. Isaiah calls the Messiah mighty God. He calls him everlasting father. Matthew tells us that the baby born in the manger there, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus identifies himself with God the Father. And God himself in Hebrews calls his son God. We could go on citing references uh, forever. But the bottom line is this. Jesus Christ the Messiah is indisputably God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. He is God. You ready for this? Period. Period. So now that I gave you 15 minutes worth of doctrine and background and prophecy and fulfillment, what does it mean? <laughs> right? So, so what? How does this apply today to my life? How, how does this apply to, to people in this room who are either uh, following Christ or are deciding to follow him? What difference does this make? The truth is that most of us aren't professors or academics, and we don't spend most of our life arguing the fine points of theology. The truth is, most of us that come into this place, we want this. We want information that we can use. We want wisdom. We want knowledge that will help us get through the day, that will help us live our life worthwhile and, and, and live productive and God-honoring lives. So how does what we just spoke about, the deity of Christ, how does it help us? And I've written down a few things that it means to me that I hope it helps you. First of all, this, it affirms that Jesus is, listen to me, the one and only way to God. It affirms that Jesus is the one and only way to God. Jonathan, what are you saying? Well, the gulf between the creator and his creation is so vast. The, the difference uh, separating the infinite from the finite it is so immense that only uh, someone who in his own person unites deity and humanity can truly unite God and man. Only one who is God and man, fully God and fully man, can bring the two together, both now and forever. So let me, so let me just go here. Buddha can't.
Confucius can't do that. Uh, no philosophy or mysticism or New Age spirituality or all the gods and goddesses of the Hindu pantheon. Not Muhammad can bring God and man together. Why? Because Muhammad was only a man. And by the way, he never claimed to be anything else. A prophet, yes, according to the Muslim religion, but still just a man. Only Jesus Christ, who in himself combines divinity and humanity, can bridge that gap. Jesus said it best when he said in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In Acts chapter number 4, verse number 12, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jonathan, what are you saying? No other person, no other religion, no other philosophy, no other way of living, no amount of goodness can bring us to God and to save us from suffering from the penalty of our sins. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do that. You say, Jonathan, well, you're a follower of Jesus. Of course, you're going to say he's the best. Listen to me. I am a follower of the Dallas Cowboys, but I'll tell you, they're not the best football team in the world. Okay? They're just not. And they might make the playoffs, but they'll probably find a way to not make the playoffs this year. And I have suffered through years and years of mediocrity, and Jason Garrett should coach somewhere else. I love the Cowboys, but they're not the best. Okay, I love Jesus, and he's the best. And it's not because I say so, it's because he's shown himself to be. I, I, I believe in God, and, and God is not real because I believe in him, right? It, it's not my belief that gives him magic God dust that helps him come alive, and as belief wanes, he shrinks. No, listen to me. God is God now, and today, and forever. He's always been. He'll always be. And I believe in him because he is, not because, he's not because I believe. Does that make sense to you? God is God. God is God. Well, Jonathan, that requires a whole lot of faith. We grew up believing in a lot of stuff that required a whole lot of faith. And I'm not going to spoil some things for you because I know some of you still believe in some things. Okay? But we grew up believing in a lot of things that required faith. But here's the difference. As we found some things to not be true, God has never changed. And he's proved himself in our lives time and time and time and time again. Those of you that are Christians, those of you who have placed your faith in Christ for salvation, can I just say, you know God is real. Why? Because of what he does in your heart. What he does in your heart. I've watched Kevin this week, and uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is just an incredible testimony. I'll say this, Ashley taught him well. Ashley taught him well. But I've watched Kevin this week as he's walked through this, this valley of the shadow of death. And that's, that's what it is, man. It just, it, it just crushes in around you. But I've watched him as he's graciously and he's peacefully endured this. And, and I look at him this morning, and man, you don't know the encouragement it is just to see him there and in his place. Why, that's exactly what Ashley would have wanted, right? But I watch, and, and there are people in this room that knew Kevin before Jesus. There are people here that knew him before Jesus. And listen, I'm just saying, there is a different Kevin sitting in that seat than before Jesus. Oh, what are you saying? I'm saying our lives are testimony to the grace and the goodness of God. That peace that passes understanding, listen, that is an evidence of God in our life. Listen, creation shows us that God is real. You cannot look at all there is and believe that that just spontaneous happen and I'm sorry but if you believe that a bunch of molecules came together and just formed all that there is you are definitely definitely underestimating the goodness of God you're underestimating his power and by the way if you want to believe that and that is your prerogative if you want to believe that know this that requires I think more faith than believing that God spoke it into existence just 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 so we're on the same page here and you can think different things about the origin of the world and all that there is. All I know is in Romans chapter number one, the Bible tells us that we can see God is through his creation. And I believe that God created. Amen. Amen. What are you saying? I'm saying Jesus changes lives. 
He changed his life. I believe this. I believe Jesus is the one and only way to God. You say, Jonathan, why do you believe that? Here's why I believe it. Because Jesus said it was so. And he said it was so. Jonathan, you're a bigot. You're intolerant. I didn't, I didn't make this up. I say all the time, I didn't write it. I just recite it. Right? And Jesus says, I'm the only way. I'm the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So it affirms that Jesus is the one and the only way to God. Secondly, this, Jesus' deity matters because it means that all of his promises will be fulfilled. If you're a Christian, listen intently right here because this is really, really good. Whatever he said would happen will happen because he has the power to do what he said he would do. And God doesn't change his mind. He won't go back on his word. He's not going to discover new information and suddenly alter his plans. He is God, and his purposes are unchanging. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 8, of the character of Christ, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. What are you saying? I'm saying he can be trusted. I'm saying we can rely on him. I'm saying we can entrust our lives to him in a way that we can't with any other person. Why? Because I know that there's nothing that's going to happen that's going to make him either unable or unwilling to care for me. There's nothing that's going to happen that is going to make him unable or unwilling to care for me now or in the future. And that that leads us back to that other part of the name, the eternal, uh, the everlasting there, Father. He's eternal. He's everlasting. He's without beginning uh, or end of days. Listen to these passages which talk about the eternality, the uh, everlasting nature of Jesus. The Bible says in John uh, chapter number one, verse one through three, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In the beginning was the word. What are you saying? I'm saying he was there when the beginning happened. He had no beginning. He's the alpha, the omega, the first and the last. John 8, 58, Jesus blew the minds of some people when he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. He's existing eternally. Uh, Hebrews chapter number one, verse number eight, uh, or, I'm sorry, verse number 10 and 11 says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. What are you saying? I'm saying he's always been. When the beginning was, he was at work. Amen? As we've been reminded over and over in the last few months, There's nothing that lasts forever. Businesses don't. (laughs) Ask Blockbuster. Corporations don't. It's been so long since Blockbuster, a few of you had to think, what is that, right? (laughs) Governments and kingdoms don't last. Even people don't last. It doesn't matter how much you, uh, you love your parents or your parents love you. It doesn't matter how much your husband or your wife cares for you. If you live long enough, there's going to be a day where they will leave. They'll abandon you. And maybe it's not them walking out. Maybe it's not by choice, but maybe it's by death. You say, well, this just took a morbid turn. Listen, their lives will someday come to an end, and there's nothing that they can do about it. Think about this, in 1998, my grandpa died of a, uh, a brain tumor. Just a couple years later, my other grandfather died of lung cancer. But my grandpa, my peepaw is what I called him, my peepaw. Uh, my peepaw, <clears throat> um, when that tumor came, he began to leave us, bit by bit, until one day, he didn't recognize us at all. He had no memory of our years together. He had no memory of the children he'd raised, the life that he'd lived. Although his love for us never diminished, eventually, eventually he left us. But Jesus is different. Jesus is different. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 5, that he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
And that's why his eternality matters. That's why his everlasting nature, that's why it matters. That's why we care that Jesus will never change and that he'll never cease to exist. Why? Because it means all the good things that he is to us right now, he's going to always be. What are you saying? Let me, let me just talk about this for a moment. She's helping me preach back there. I appreciate that. What are you saying? I'm saying he's my provider and he'll always be. I'm saying he's my protector and he'll always be. I'm saying he's my savior and he'll always be. He's my refuge and he'll always be. He, he's my strength and he'll always be. His love for me is never going to change, either neither in this world or the next. That means a lot to me. Why? Because people fail us, right? I've been failed. If you look back at your life, there are a lot of people in your life who've let you down. And that's why this means so much to me. He's faithful and he's just. He doesn't fail. You say, well, how can you say that? I can say it because I know his ways are perfect. I don't know why he does what he does. This week I would have given you a hundred bucks to know why he did what he did, but I, I don't. I'll not claim to. I'm not going to sit down and pretend like I know everything. I have no clue why he does what he does. But I do know this. I've seen in my life where I didn't know, and you wait a little while, and you wait a little while, and it shows itself. God makes no mistakes. But more than that, God never leaves you. He's always there for you. And that comfort that he provides, listen, if you're in this room this morning, Look at death, and you don't have Jesus. Death is a devastating thing. Failure is a devastating thing. But Jesus gives us hope that death is not final, that life can be eternal. Uh, Jesus gives us hope that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And, and so we look at something like what happened this week, and, and, and listen, and we, we sorrow because our lives are different, but we rejoice. Why? Because God is God, and he'll always be God. He's always been God, and he's not changing anytime soon. And guess what? When we put our faith in God, he becomes our everlasting father. That's amazing. And that gives us hope. And that allows us to rejoice. Why? Because God is good. Can I give you a couple of different things about him, uh, about his relationship with us that are eternal, and then we're, we're going to move toward a close here. Our joy in him is going to be eternal. Our joy is eternal. Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Our joy in him is eternal. Our glory is and him's going to be eternal. When Christ returns, we're going to be transformed into something more wonderful than we could ever imagine. And our new and glorious life will never end, the Bible teaches. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light affliction, but is, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way of glory. Let me say God's love and his goodness toward us are eternal. They'll never fail. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. You ready for something that will blow your mind? Before you ever were, God loved you. The Bible says, Before you were formed in your mother's womb, He knew you. Let's think about that for just a moment, okay? Just a moment. I don't know about you, but when I meet somebody, it takes me a little bit to love them, right? I like them. I'll try to like them. Some people are a little bit more difficult to like and love than others, right? For example, the New York Yankees, right? Shots fired. <laughs> just kidding. Um... Some people are a little harder to love. Most of the time, most of the time. Because we're human and because we're, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're prone to fail, right? 
typically, uh, we measure how much we like a person on how nice they are, right? How good they are. to eh. Now, we're supposed to love them, right? But we often say this. We often say, I love everybody, but I don't like some people, right? The truth is, most of, most of the time, most of the time, uh, we love pay- people based on who they are. But here's the amazing thing. Before you were ever anything, God loved you. Before you were a thought in your parents' mind, before your parents were a thought, before your grandparents were, are you following? I could go on all day. He loved you. And he orchestrated a plan of redemption. We talked about back in Genesis, he put the plan in place. Man, this is so good. He put the plan in place all the way back when man failed to redeem mankind. And it would be one thing if back in Genesis they had failed, but everybody else was decent. I mean, they were okay. But then we get to Noah, and the Bible says that the world was exceedingly bad and wicked, and the thoughts of man was evil continually, and he could have wiped the face of the earth but yet he spared man. And rather than starting over, hitting reset, he, he delivered man. And then we see Israel through all her wonderings and failures and grumblings and over and over and over. God redeemed them and God sent deliverers. And God sends people like Moses and Joshua and Caleb to lead them even if they're wondering, and then, and then they want a king, and they shouldn't have done this, and they shouldn't have done this, and he sends judges and kings and all this. Why? Because he loved man. Fast forward to Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ comes, and he's born. The Bible says he lives a perfect life. Now, I try to be good, and I try to be nice, but I'm in no means perfect. And uh, nobody will ever accuse me of being perfect. But he was. And yet, and yet, the world hated him. Hated him. I mean, absolutely loathed him. He goes around, and, and listen, here's the amazing thing. He never stole from anybody. He never did. He never mistreated anybody. Are you following what I'm saying? He never, the Bible says there was no God found in me in his mouth. No, no sin, no imperfection. And yet they, they hated him so much they got a group of guys together to lie about him, to convict him of blasphemy. And the funny thing is their testimonies didn't even match up, but yet he was convicted and he was persecuted and he was uh, crucified. Why? For being perfect? You following what I'm saying? Why would, why would he do that? Uh, that, that's preposterous. That's the struggle I have with, with Christianity. How could God humble himself and give himself to death? Uh, how could he allow himself to, to limit his power and not uh, call down angels? Doesn't, isn't he in charge of the angels? Why didn't he call? I mean, one. One could have done the job, right? Why would he do that? You ready? He loved you. Before the foundations of the world, he loved you. Before you were thought in any imagination, he loved you. By the way, before you had ever done anything wrong, he loved you. After you did wrong, he <laughs> loves you. You follow what I'm saying? And his love for you doesn't change. Because his love for you is all about his goodness and not about yours. Why? Because it's perfect love. It's everlasting love. How beautiful is that? When we talk about eternality, His love, his goodness, I'm thankful for that. But I think the thing I'm most thankful for is that my salvation's eternal. My salvation's eternal. Jonathan, what's that mean? Let me me just spell it out for you a little bit here. God's punishment for our sin. God's anger toward our sin. Say, well, if God's so good, why is God angry? Well, here's why. The Bible says our holiness has violated, or our, our, I'm sorry, our, our sin has violated his holiness. God's holy. God's perfect. He's just. Hard for us to understand because we've never been there, nor will we ever be. He's perfect, sinless, holy. And uh, the Bible says our, our sin violates him. Bible, matter of fact, just, just so we're clear here, just so you understand this, the Bible tells us we can't do anything to save ourselves because even our righteousness, our good works, you ready, are as filthy rags. I'm saying my goodness is still, you ready for this? My goodness is still a violation of his holiness. So good luck trying to be good enough. Yeah. 
You know, you understand there are entire belief systems in our world today that will teach you if you do enough good or if, you, if, you, if your good outweighs your bad or whatever, then, then you can merit the favor of God. Listen to me. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Your sin has to be paid for. But here's the, here's the revelation this morning. Here's the amazing truth. You ready? You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to pay for it. It's already been paid for. It's already been paid for. Uh, some headlines a couple couple weeks ago. Uh, Tyler Perry, you know Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry went to uh, Walmart layaway, and uh, I forget where it was. He not the city I live in, but uh, another city. And he he paid for everybody's items on layaway for them to get their items on layaway. I don't know what that taught you, but that taught me to go put everything in Walmart on layaway and pray for a celebrity in Largo, Florida, right? Because I think Kid Rock did it as well. And other, I mean, there's all kinds of celebrities like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's go pay for everything on layaway. So I went and I loaded up on layaway. I was there for like three days, but I got it done, all right? Just kidding. That didn't happen, Otis. I really, I really didn't do that. Beth Ann would have got on to me. <clears throat> But imagine what it felt like to have gone into Walmart, not have money for Christmas presents, be paying them off during the year, and get there and, oh, it's, it's already been paid for. What? It's been paid? No way. Right? Can I tell you, your sin's been paid for? Every single bit of it. Say, man, I've committed a lot of sins. He's paid for them. Yeah. I'm pretty bad. I'm probably going to commit a lot more. He's paid for them, right? And, and the amazing thing about salvation is salvation is so simple. <clears throat> the Bible tells us that Jesus became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. Uh, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 7.25 that he's able to save them to the uttermost, uh, save them completely, which come to God uh, by him, seeing he liveth to make intercession for them. What are you saying? I'm saying Jesus said in John 10, 28, that I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Here's an amazing truth. What God did for the sin of man, he did eternally. He paid it all. So here's the truth. Everyone in this room, you ready for this? Your sin has been paid for. Woo! You're like, man, you missed the greatest church service ever. I went to church and the pastor's like, man, your sin's been paid for. Awesome. But can I just tell you this? Your sin's been paid for, but you have to accept that payment. It's been paid for. And by the way, his perfect sinless blood was enough to pay for it. He, he did his part, right? He shed his blood and he didn't even open his mouth as for his shearers is dumb, so opened he not his mouth. He, he took all of my sin and all of that pain, and he took the wrath of the Father upon himself, and he paid it. He paid it completely. He didn't have to borrow anything from anybody. His perfect sinless blood was enough to pay for all of it, but it's not yours unless you accept it. So let, let's slow down and just let's get through this really carefully and clearly because I don't want you to misunderstand this at all. You can walk out the doors today knowing that you would spend eternity in heaven. You can. You're able to. Not of yourself. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What are you saying? God made salvation very simple, and he made it very clear that it's not about you. It's all about him. So you can leave this place with your sins paid for, completely able, but you can't save yourself. The only one that can pay for sin is Jesus. Now here's the deal. He's done his job. And what he offers to you is eternal life, but you've got to accept it. Now, here's what that life is. That life is a gift. <clears throat> I, this morning, have $100. I've saved for 22 years to have this $100. I now have a $100 bill. 
Uh, that's a lot of pennies, John, a lot of them. I have a $100 bill. <clears throat> and if I stay this morning, uh, I would like to give this $100 as a gift. I think this place would turn into the Ellen Show, and everybody would get very excited very quickly. Even the ones of you that wouldn't show excitement, you know inside of yourself you're very excited about that potential opportunity. But I'm going to reward those that sit closest to the front. Uh, so Mr. Otis Little, come here. Otis. Otis, come here. Otis has got his head bowed. He's like, please don't pick me. Please don't pick me. Please, Actually, please pick me. Yes, please pick me. <clears throat> Otis yesterday, by the way, Otis cooked all the food for yesterday. Turn around, turn around. Oh, yeah. Cooked all the food for yesterday. And... Uh, Olive Garden ain't got nothing on Otis. But if I say to Otis, 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 I have $100 here, and I want to give it to you. Okay? So in order for this to become yours, what do you have to do? Help me with my illustration, Otis. You'd have to. Okay. All right. Now, it is not mine anymore. It is now yours. Okay, now I want it back. <laughs> now, hold, hold on. Y'all are so quick to judge. Not because I'm going to keep it. Some of you are slower, and I want to make sure you understand it. Got $100, and it belongs to me, because I just took it back from him. <laughs> belongs to me. For it to become his, he has to do what? Rocket science. Rocket science. I want you to think about something. Oh, you can say, hold on to it. I gave it to you. It's actually a gift. All right, so listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. I actually owed him like 400 bucks, so my tab's down to like three. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listen. <clears throat> he didn't do anything to get that 100 bucks. My 100 bucks. Chose to give it to get, chose to, I chose to give it to him. I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> chose to give it to him. Why? Because I love him. Okay? Now, here's the deal. God's given eternal life. It's a gift. Uh, the, my favorite verses in all the Bible talk about the gift, the gift of God. Sal salvation is the gift. Uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, right? Are you following what I'm saying? John 3.16, whosoever believeth in him, right? Are you listening to me? I just forgot John 3.16. What's John 3.16? For God so loved the world, oh my goodness, that he Gave, all right, gift. Man, that was embarrassing, all right? Uh, gift, gift. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, right? Christ died for us, right? Like, gift. Jesus gave himself. Now, here's the deal. You can choose to accept or receive the gift, but it's already been paid for, all right? So here's what we would do if we found out that Tyler Perry had paid for layaway for um, all of the store, and somebody had literally put every item on layaway, okay? And we found out Tyler Perry paid for it, uh, but we found out that that person didn't want to accept Tyler Perry's gift because they wanted to pay for it themselves, okay? We would look at that person, we would say, a little bit cray-cray, okay? Why? Because why would you try to pay for something that's already been paid for? Why would you not take the gift when it's offered? So I'm going to just make this very, very simple this morning. <clears throat> Christ is the everlasting Father. But if you never place your faith in him and accept the gift of salvation, he's not your Father. So, so picture this illustration this way, and, and we'll close here. Let's say, did, did any of you, you grow up without a dad? Any of you grow up without a dad? A lot of you. A lot of you. Thank you for that. I grew up, I grew up without a dad uh, in my life. My dad and I have restored our relationship, but for, for a pivotal part of my life, my dad wasn't there. And uh, I used to look, I had a friend named uh, Daniel and a friend named Wesley. And uh, I used to look at Daniel and Wesley. I looked at their dads. And I didn't want their video games. I didn't want their new cars. I didn't want their clothes. I wanted their dad. <laughs> kind of a weird thing, but that was me. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted their dad because their dad, to me, looked like everything a dad should be. Now, I know their dads have flaws and things like that, but I looked at Joe Ray, and I looked at Stan Durrett, and I said, man, I would kill, not really, but I would love, right, to have a dad like that. 
right? I've watched Kevin this week, and I'll be very, very honest with you. I, I, as a Christian, have seen Kevin's testimony through this, and I've thought, I have the same dad as him. I hope that I love him that much, right? But if I'm on the outside of this situation, and I'm seeing the way that this, the grace and the, 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 just the peace that's been, and I look at his relationship with his father, I tell you what that makes me want. That makes me want his dad. You listening to what I'm saying? So, so here, here's, here's the cool thing. His dad is always adopting. Yeah, the adoption of sons. He's always adopting. He's got a room for any of you that want to be his child. Any one of you. So you look at Ashley's life this week. We did that yesterday. We celebrated a life well lived. She, she did more in 33 years than most people do in a lifetime. And uh, you look at the life she lived, and I told him yesterday, I said, man, you want what she had, you can have it, Jesus. And so this morning, I'll tell you, you want what she had, you want what we see in Kevin right now, you want that peace, you can have it. You can have it. It's yours. How, how do I get it? Well, take your Bibles to Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10, we're going to close right here. Romans chapter number 10 and verse number uh, 9. <clears throat> The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jonathan, how do I receive that gift? It's very, very simple. You ready for this? Believe in Jesus Christ, that he's the only one that can save you from your sins and that he's done the job. Believe that he was killed, he was buried. The Bible teaches he rose again. What are you saying? The grave couldn't hold him. He rose again. He lives to make intercession for us. The Bible says if you'll do that, you'll place your faith in Christ. What is that, what is that verse saying in verse number 9? If it says at the end of that verse, thou shalt be saved. So there's a condition if. If you place your faith in him, if you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you call on him, right, you'll be saved. <clears throat> I like whenever somebody tells me, if you do this, you get this. I especially like it when what I get is chocolate chip cookies. Really enjoy that. I'm telling you this morning, if you'd like eternal life and a relationship with God on this earth, you can have it, but you've got to take it. You can have it, but you've got to take it. No matter what you're going through, suffering, disappointment, pain, sorrow, confusion, no matter how other people treat us, no matter if we've seen our dreams realized or crumble and fall to the ground, Jesus provides peace and contentment. And everything in this world is temporary. Every single thing is temporary. It's going to pass away. But our life in Christ is forever. He's eternal. And he will never die. And he offers you that life. His love for us, his goodness, his compassion, his kindness, it will never end. We are his children and he is our father. And this morning he offers you salvation. So my question for, the, for you this morning is this. Will you take the gift? Will you take the gift? If Otis had said, no, nah, I'm good. I have a feeling that some of you would have lined up and you would have been, you would have been okay with taking the gift, right? That's a hundred bucks. That'll buy you a hundred double cheeseburgers. Actually, it won't anymore because they McDonald's raised their prices. What a world we live in. A hundred bucks will get you a little bit of gas, get you a few double cheeseburgers, right? Some Reese's cups. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do with 100 bucks. Man. Your life will last eternally. The gift of salvation is eternal. It's forever. I'm not going to try to sell you Jesus because I believe that cheapens him. I'm not going to try to market Jesus. But I'll tell you this, he'll change your life if you let him. And some of you, 
Everything you're looking for in life is found in Jesus. Some of you, everything you're looking for is found in Jesus. So would you do me a favor this morning? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Nobody looking around. I'm going to ask you very simply two questions. First question is this. If you were to die today and you'd say, Jonathan, I don't know Christ as my Savior. I don't know if I were to die that heaven would be my home and that concerns me. And I'd like you to pray for me. I would like you to, to pray for me this morning. I'm not sure if I died that heaven would be my home. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I've asked other people to bow their heads and close their eyes. But I would ask you if you'd say, Jonathan, that's me. If I died today, I don't know that heaven would be my home. Would you just slip your hand up there where you are? Let me pray for you. See that hand? Thank you. Anyone else? Jonathan, if I died today, I don't know that heaven would be my home. And secondly, this. Secondly, this. Jonathan, if I died today, I don't know that heaven would be my home, but that concerns me, and I'd like to know. I'd like to know. I'd like to place my faith in Christ this morning. Say, Jonathan, that's me. I'd like to place my faith in Christ this morning. Would you slip your hand up there where you are? I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. All right, will you look at me real quick? Everybody look at me. The few of you that raised your hands there that said, I'm not sure, let me tell you how easy it is. You ready for this? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for your sin. He paid for it. He paid for every single thing you've ever done. And you don't have to worry yourself about trying to pay for it because he's already paid it. This morning, salvation is this easy. You ready for this? Where you are, tell the Lord, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I mess up. Nobody has to show me that. I know I do. But God, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And as best I know how, I place my faith in you. Would you forgive me of my sin? Would you take me to heaven when I die? And the Bible teaches us, listen to me, the Bible teaches us if we'll place our faith in Christ, if we'll ask him to forgive us of our sin, listen to me, he'll do that. He'll do that. So one more time, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? No one looking. If that was you, you said, Jonathan, I'd like to place my faith in Christ. Can I encourage you? The piano's going to play for just a moment. Can I encourage you just where you are? Can you do that right now? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. If I were to die today, I don't know that I'd go to heaven. But I believe that you died on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to take me heaven when I die. I'm placing my faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's you this morning and you say, Jonathan, I place my faith in Christ the best I know how. I ask the Lord to be my Savior. You say, Jonathan, that's me this morning. I place my faith in Him. Would you slip your hand up there where you are? Jonathan, I place my faith in Christ this morning. I see that hand. I see that hand. Look at me. And we're closed here. Look at me. <laughs> best decision you'll ever make. Best decision you'll ever make. The best decision you'll ever make is the decision you just made. And it's an eternal decision. Well, why? That verse tells me that no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Right? Cody, come here. Come here, Cody. Come here. Give me that $100 back. <laughs> come here, Cody. If you can take that, you can have Otis's $100. Take it from me. Take it from me. Come on. All right, now hang on. I'm just telling you, you're not going to be able to open it. But I'm going to give you something later because you were an awesome help to me. And I have a bag full of candy that has your name on it. Pound it. All right. Now listen to me. You say, well, you picked the smallest guy in the room. I did, and here's why. You ready? I did, and here's why. Because you compared to God, you are no match. By the way, Satan compared to God, no match. I don't need to get Hercules and have him come up here and show you that he can bring you. Because no man compares with the might of my God. There is no one that can compare to him. What are you saying? I'm saying what you just did, the decision you just made, the faith that you placed in Christ is eternal. He took care of it, bought, paid for, done deal. And Tyler Perry ain't got nothing on Jesus. That's awesome. If you're a Christian today, rejoice in your everlasting father. If you, if you met Christ today, rejoice, because you're now our sibling. You're our brother, our sister in Christ. That's amazing. I'm so excited for you. Those of you that placed your faith in Christ this morning, I'd love to talk to you about that. I'd love to tell you about how he's changed my life and how he can continue to change yours, because he's a great God. He's a great God.
Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness to us. Father, I ask you that you just make it very, very clear to us how powerful and how mighty you are. We thank you for the peace we've seen in Kevin's life this week. We thank you for the peace that we've seen just through the storm. We know that that's only possible through Jesus. This morning even, we thank you for the two that placed their faith in Christ, the others that are pondering that. Father, I pray that you'd help them to place their faith in you. I pray that they make that decision. We praise you for the chance to come.